Um, so good evening, everybody. Uh, my, my name's Stuart. Um, I currently work with Keele University and run a small geological consultancy. I've been a geologist for 40 years or thereabouts. Um, I've recently come back to Warwickshire. I, I, I live in Lapworth, so I'm, I'm local. And for the last two or three years, I've been looking at aspects of the geology of Warwickshire. Can't claim to be an expert on the geology of Warwickshire, but I have seen some bits and I know quite a lot about geology. So there's a lovely view looking out across um, one of the quarries on the Nuneaton Ridge, looking back at some very, very old rocks that are 600 million years old or thereabouts, out across the plains of, of the Hinkley Basin, looking across towards Leicestershire. Lovely. So I'm going to talk you through, assuming that works. Yes, there's my presentation. Actually, is the is my screen bar with you? Can I can I minimise that? Or even move? Yeah, let's minimise it. There we go. We can just see the slides are in. Can you? Okay. So I've actually got a bar across the top. So there's um, there's my presentation. We're going to talk about the geology of Warwickshire. I can't make you all experts in geology in, in an hour and a half or thereabouts, um, but I'm going to show you a little bit about how geology works and some examples of um, our crops in Warwickshire that tell a geological story. So the general theme of the presentation, I'm going to start with a one slide introduction to the Warwickshire Geological Conservation Group, in case you're not familiar with it. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about geoscience in the context of society in the natural world. That's just one slide as well. Then we're going to spend some time looking at concepts in geology, try and get you into the idea of how um, plate tectonics drive most things in, in, in geology. Uh, and then we'll think about deep time, how we got our heads around four and a half billion years of time. Even I struggle with that sometimes. We'll talk about the rock cycle and then a little bit about stratigraphy and extinctions through geological time. Then I've got a whole bunch of slides around the geology of, of Warwickshire and some important geological sites in Warwickshire that, that you can visit and go and look for fossils and structures and, and whatever. And then at the end, um, I don't really have any slides, but we'll just talk about geology and the environment, the importance of geoconservation, um, why it really is important to uh, retain our crops and quarries that we can go and see um, rocks so we can still correlate and understand um, what the rocks contain and how they impact the environmental landscape. Um, so we'll just have a discussion around that at the end. So that's, that's the talk. Um, I'm more than happy to take questions as we go through it. Um, and I think we're going to have a comfort break halfway through the talk. So Deborah, if you let me know when that's appropriate, we'll take a five or 10 minute break. Okay, on the right there of your screens, is a delightful image uh, of the topography of Britain. And I sh I'm showing that because actually you, you can see the geology. And a lot of what we're going to do is, is looking, is thinking about rocks in 3D and seeing the geology. So in the bottom of that image in, in Southern England, in the wheel, you can see um, folded rocks that form a large uh, domal structure. That's the wheeled anticline. Above that, you can see a ridge of rocks running across the Midlands into Norfolk and up, up into Lincolnshire and beyond into Yorkshire. And that's the outcrop of the Jurassic rocks that we will explore at some point. And then beyond that, you can see uh, the Midland Plains um, and some of the horse that form the, the coal fields, the Warwickshire coal field and beyond. And, and beyond that, the Pennines, which are old Carboniferous rocks, you can see the old rocks of the, of the Welsh uplands. So the geology is there, just in the topography. And in countries like the UK, where we don't have huge amounts of exposure, actually understanding the geology from topography is, is a really important skill. So let's just talk a little bit about the Warwickshire Geological Conservation Group. For those of you that are not familiar with it, there's the website. Um, there's lots of information on the website you can follow up on, including details of every outcrop that we monitor. So the group is a registered charity that we're all volunteers um, and they work throughout 
Warwickshire, monitoring triple SI's local geological sites. We run various outreach and education programs through workshops, field trips, evening lectures. And then we have um, a large bequest or a significant bequest from um, a former member who passed away some 10, 12 years ago. And we use uh, the funds from that bequest um, to support all of those activities in, in geoscience learning in general. We're more than happy to work with other groups and we're very keen to work with the Warwickshire Wildlife Trust in any capacity. So please do feel free to, to contact myself or Ray or any other members. Um, we'd be delighted to talk to you. We have something like 100 local geological sites across the county uh, and several triple SIs which we, which we monitor and maintain. In fact, we were out last weekend in the field working on, on one particular um, LGS which we were clearing vegetation and, and, and actually had a very pleasant day because it was nice and sunny. Uh, and, and again, if you would like to join the society, it's free to students and you're most welcome to take part in field work, field trips, conservation work and, and any of our lectures. So we have field trips, uh, evening and weekends throughout the summer. We have some residential trips. We um, do lectures throughout the winter, usually once a month. And again, they're all on the website. So if you want to see the previous program and some of the videos, they're, all, they're also there. Uh, the Brandon Wall, which I'm sure some of you will know about at Brandon Marsh, it is a display that was put together over, over several years uh, that actually records the, the geology of uh, Warwickshire in, in building stones. So if you want a quick introduction, nip up to across the Brandon Marsh and take a look at the, the samples in the Brandon Wall and they pretty much show you all the, all the lithologies um, of rocks in Warwickshire. It's a lovely display. Um, well worth a visit. So what you can see across the bottom of that slide um, is, is how you start on the left with the oldest rocks, um, the Caldico Volcanics, which are Precambrian, and as you go to the right, the rocks get successively younger all the way through to the Jurassic, Hortonstone and Ulysic Limestones. And what you see in the geology of Warwickshire um, is that some 550, 600 million years ago, Warwickshire was located um, in the Southern Hemisphere, um, south of the equator. Um, and then eventually with time, because of plate tectonics, which we'll come on to in a minute, um, Warwickshire, the, what is the location of Warwickshire today, moved northwards across the equator around 300 million years ago, then into a huge desert system in the Trias in, in, in about 250 million years ago, and has then been moving further northwards to its current location ever since. So in a nutshell, there is the geology of Warwickshire. It, it's 600 million years of, of Earth's history with an ice age um, deposit on top, um, which, which is preserved around the county. So after the Geological Warwickshire Conservation Group, uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about how geoscience um, fits in today's and, and future society. So this is um, a slide, it's a poster actually, you can, I think it's available free. There's the website, it's the UK's Geological Society of London. They do several of these posters, I think I used one more in the talk. Um, so this just shows in a, in a very simplified form how geoscience interacts and fits into society. So down the bottom of, of that slide, <coughs> you, you can see all sorts of resources, everything from critical minerals to geothermal energy, um, to hydrogeology, to disposal of radioactive waste materials. Um, on the right hand side, there's exploration for um, hydrocarbons, um, storing hydrocarbons and, and other gases underground. So there's a whole resource base that, that geoscience and geoscientists address, but it then also interacts very closely with society in many, many other ways. So if you look around the bridge, um, there's erosional management for coastal, um, for coastlines. Um, geology is fundamental in understanding um, how and why coastlines erode. Some coastlines deposit, some erode, and there are various approaches you can take to monitor and control erosion. Um, there are specialist geoscientists 
paleontologists, environmental geochemists that work with contaminated lands. Um, there are various geoscientists that gather data, such as seismic data, um, look at geohazards. Um, so there's a whole host of ways in which geoscientists interact with modern society and will contribute to resources and society for the future. So if you want to see more of that, that's, that, that's available on the JOLSOC website free. There's the link. In fact, what I will do, if, if you're interested, I'll actually leave the presentation with Deborah so you can look at this in your, in your leisure. Oh, great. Thanks, Stuart. Yeah, there's no problem. Yeah, there's nothing confidential in here. Everything I've put together is from public domain material and, and where I've taken diagrams, it's, it's, it's acknowledged. Okay, so we're gonna spend a little bit of time trying to understand how the earth works. In fact, there's a, there's a, there's a great um, Dawning Crinsley book called How the Earth Works. A lot of these were taken from that, uh, but it is, it, it's great for kids. It's great if you just want to see the concepts behind how the, the, the earth actually functions. So the driving force for pretty much everything we see at the earth's surface is this thing called plate tectonics. Uh, and plate tectonics grew out of, there was a gentleman back in the 1850s called um, uh, Alfred Wegener, who, who had the notion of continental drift. He simply placed together the coastlines of Africa and South America and saw them made a fit. And from that, he developed the idea that actually the continents had drifted apart. He didn't have a mechanism. The person that first came up with the mechanism was this gentleman, Arthur Holmes, um, who published some papers back in the 1910s and 1920s. Uh, and his view was actually the, it, the core of the earth was very hot. Uh, and that generated it in a molten or semi-molten outer part of the core, and the mantle. It, it generated convection currents. So those ideas were around for the 1920s and first published in 1944, um, but because it was so revolutionary at the time, none of his ideas were really accepted. In fact, he was, he was really mocked. So his book is still available, Principles of Physical Geology. Uh, there's a new version of that um, edited by a gentleman called um, Paul McDuff, and you can buy it online. I think it's on eBay for five or six pounds, not very much. If you want to see how some of these ideas develop, that's a, that's a good starting point. So the structure of the Earth has a thin crust, which varies from around um, 35 to 40 kilometers in the oceans to 70 or 80 in places 100 kilometers thick in the continents. And that thin crust overlies um, what we call the mantle, which is um, several hundred kilometers thick and the mantle is essentially solid but because of the higher pressure um, as you go towards the core uh, it behaves in a um, in a ductile way and that is an inner and outer core of different composition that are essentially molten and they generate heat from radioactivity that provides heat into the into the mountain into the mantle and in the mantle, um, the heat differential from the inner and outer core um, does set up convection currents. So where hot mantle material rises, uh, if you look on the diagram on the right, say let's look at the let's look at the um, where should we go? Let's look at the somewhere here on the on, on the right hand side, the large low velocity province. Um, you can see that there are um, arrows rising up. So this is hot mantle material that rises as a plume towards the, towards the crust. And then in places, you can see there are green slabs. We've got the term sinking mantle. So this is cold mantle from beneath the Earth's crust um, that's sinking down. So these essentially produce convection currents that sink down and rise up because of the temperature differential from the inner and outer core. So this, we know this has been going on uh, way back into the Precambrian for many hundreds of millions of years. This is the driving force for all the surface effects we see on the planet. Um, there's a couple of things I should mention as well. So you can see here that the, the dark green slabs are the continental crust 
and they're thicker than the oceans. So here's the Indian Ocean, here's Africa. This is the Atlantic Ocean down here on the... Is my mouse moving, Deborah? As I talk? Sorry, I don't know if you could see me. I have my thumbs up. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah okay, good. No, I can't. I've, I've minimised that. Sure. And there's here's South America and there's the Pacific Ocean. So the oceanic crust is thinner and more dense. So the, ba the basic way this works is that oceanic crust, because it's thinner and denser, sinks beneath continental crust. And then as you have a plume rising, that's molten material um, that impinges on the crust. And when that uh, impinges on the crust, um, it produces local melting and then spreads laterally. So these rising plumes impinge on crust somewhere. Sometimes it's con on continental crust, sometimes it's on ocean crust, and then they move laterally. And that produces, oops, that produces the lateral drive. So plate tectonics is completely driven by convection cells in the mantle. And that's been going on for millions of years. Because of that, the continents literally move around the surface of the globe. So it's just a little quick look at how this works and how it was discovered. So even though Arthur Holmes had the idea, he couldn't actually prove it. He did some experiments, um, which indicated it was possible, but it didn't provide scientific proof. The proof came from a gentleman called Fred Vine, and there's the reference at the bottom. But there's another great book, if you're interested, it's also still in print, um, Brown et al, 1994, Understanding the Earth. Um, actually, I prefer the 1985 volume, first edition, but the 1994 one, again, it's available on Amazon or eBay or Sangnam Bookshop, five pounds or thereabout. If you're interested, it's well worth a read. So on the left um, is an image of the ocean floor um, that looks at the magnetic susceptibility of the ocean floor. And Fred Vine and, and some of his colleagues were recording a magnetic signal on the ocean floor uh, and they noticed these stripes. And the stripes aren't random, they have a dis distinct pattern. So if we look in the centre of um, those stripes, they're coloured. The red, the red one actually is where a mantle plume rises beneath it and then spreads laterally to the west uh, and to the east. And the colour is the age of the magnetic stripes. So red is present day, so this is recent. And then as you go further out, they get older. In this case, they go out to 10 million years or so. So here, Fred Vine and his co-workers saw straight away that here was a record of increasing age of crust as you went from this central ridge. And they also noticed that um, today, the magnetic um, anomaly has the same orientation as the present day magnetic field. But adjacent to it, and in a mirror pattern on either side, the magnetic anomaly reverses. So this is what we call normal polarity. This is reverse polarity, then it goes normal, then reverse, on, on it goes. So there's a pattern here recorded in the Earth's magnetic, in, in the rock's magnetic susceptibility on the ocean floor um, of time getting older as we go from a, a central ridge. Um, so to cut a long story short, lots of thinking and, and a huge revolution for the Earth sciences, and the story is that as the magma rises from um, the lower part of the mantle and pinches on the ocean floor and cools and crystallizes, it crystallizes and then spreads laterally, both sides of this central ridge. And there's one of those in the middle of the Indian Ocean, there's one in the middle of the Atlantic, there's one in the Pacific. We call these mid-ocean ridges. Um, because the Earth's magnetic fields flip, the poles actually, the, the North Pole becomes the South Pole and vice versa. And that happens every 100,000 years or so. Actually, it's a few hundred thousand years. 
So, wow, we don't actually know quite what causes that. There are some theories, but it's extraordinary. Here is a record of the Earth's magnetic field flipping. If you look at the central chart, which is MA, million years ago, time, zero to 10 million years, the same uh, period covered by the magnetic stripes on the ocean floor. You can see there's a normal polarity that's lasted for around 400,000 years, and then a negative polarity that lasted for 100 or so thousand years. So it, the magnetic field flips with, reg, with, with regularity every few hundred thousand years, and it's recorded in the ocean floor. And this is proof that uh, a mantle plume rises beneath um, these oceanic ridges and the ocean floor spreads laterally as it cools and it records the Earth's magnetic field. Wow. And geologists use magnetic polarity along with radi radiometric isotopes and fossils to date rocks through time. So there we go. Now we know how not only does, not, not only does the plate tectonics actually occur, but we, we know how it works. So plate tectonics is actually key to everything. You can go to an outcrop and look at samples at a, at a, at a quarry scale and start to interpret geology in terms of plate tectonics and plate movements. So this just is a slide I have taken from the United States Geological Survey. Um, it just shows those sort of processes taking place. So in the center of the slide, here's the mantle material rising. And there's the oceanic spreading ridge. As you move across either side of that, the oceanic plate uh, moves laterally because remember this is denser than continental crust. When it collides with continental crust, it sinks beneath it. We call that a subduction zone. So this is the subducting plate. Sorry. So the subducting plate sinks down. As it sinks down, it starts to melt and that then generates um, uh, shallow magma that rises and can cause volcanoes, does cause volcanoes. If it collides with continental crust, um, you produce a mountain belt because of the deformation associated with that collision. Um, there are things called hotspots or mantle plumes, such as, for example, the Galapagos um, or the Canaries, which are little continental um, shield volcano slabs that sit above a rising plume of um, mantle material. <coughs> Another one would be Hawaii. So these are um, deep ocean um, shield volcanoes that sit above a single mantle plume. And then if the uh, laterally moving oceanic plate hits another oceanic plate, one of them has to sink down. Um, and that depends on rates of movements, the exact composition of the two plates. So this is another subduction zone. In this case, it's ocean crust against, sorry. My fault previous previous this is ocean crust against ocean crust um, so that get, actually gives rise to three types of plate boundary the um, the top one here um, is a convergent plate boundary with um, crust sinking beneath um, another crust as a subduction zone this is a spreading a divergent plate boundary uh, with a mantle plume underneath it and the crust moving laterally aside. And this one here is a transform fault, uh, which, which is actually shown here on this 3D graphic, where a lateral, a lateral fault displaces, um, they're essentially accommodation faults um, that take up strain and produce lateral transform movements um, in the crust. So, uh, Pretty much all the geology and topography we see, mountain ranges, deep ocean trenches, volcanic islands, oceanic ridges, are all a function of plate tectonics. Really important stuff. There you go. These are all places I've been to. Um, 2018 Kashmir, there's an earthquake. That's a consequence of these faults, in this case, not transform faults, but faults between uh, the colliding Indian plate and the Euro-Asian plate um, causing plate movements, earthquakes. Um, the uh, Cumbria-Viadja 
eruption last year on La Palma. Um, that is one of these mantle plumes with, a vol with volcanic uh, molten rocks coming to the surface beneath an ocean island. And Mount, Mount Everest, that's a huge mountain range, the, the world's largest mountain range, the Himalayas, um, formed by the collision between India and Asia. And the set that actually right at the top of the peak of Mount Everest, you can see there are um, layered rocks, they're ocean sediments. There's actually a limestone right on the top of Everest. Uh, with seashells in it that was on the sea floor and you, uh, for many years um, Victorian uh, gentlemen scientists did ask how on earth can you get fossils on the top of mountains well the answer is plate tectonics that's because the deformation associated with that collision uh, pushes limestones up to the surface wow so let's hope everyone accepts plate tectonics the next challenge is to grasp this idea of geological time or deep time. Um, there was a gentleman called Bishop Usher who spent many years, in fact he devoted the latter part of his life, um, to working out the chronology of the Bible. And he looked at all the names in the Bible and, gener and looked at all the generations and then went back through time um, stack them all together and he actually used um, um, some astrological events to um, calibrate his time and he calculated the earth was formed on September the 10th somewhere on a Saturday afternoon I think he thought it was most likely to be six o'clock just in time for the Sabbath uh, in 4004 BC so he thought the world was you know, 6,000 years old based on the Bible chronology. Well, actually, if we know the Earth is some four and a half billion years old. Now, that's four, four and a half billion years is, is a vast amount of time. It's phenomenal. The, um, the universe is some 13 billion years old. So there's a whole story between the formation of the planets and the time before that, which we'll leave here for the time being. So the diagram on the left is um, a spiral which, which captures that geological time for you. And you can see here right at the front of the spiral, uh, there's, there's Homo sapiens. And he's actually, you know, we're, we're incredibly recent. If you take time backwards down the spiral, here we go back down to four and a half billion years. And for the first, um, three billion years or thereabouts um, the, the first life is, is at three billion years and then for the next two billion years there were only single celled organisms uh, and all of that time is taken up by what is referred to as the Precambrian uh, there's a whole stratigraphy for the Precambrian some geoscientists uh, spend their life studying the Precambrian um, and it has been called the boring billions because before 540 million years ago or thereabouts there are no fossils with hard body parts so you only get the the faintest we'll have a look at some when we go and look at um, some of the oldest rocks in Warwickshire um, there are no hard fossil parts so you only get impressions in the rocks and they're extraordinarily rare but there are fossils single-celled organisms that have been found that go back three billion years um, and if you look at the spiral, we have a series of epochs that go back, sorry about that, um, and then into, from in the tertiary period, and then the Cretaceous and back, Jurassic and so on. So all of those rocks have, have been dated by a combination of radiometric dating and fossils and magnetic polarity reversals, and they tell a story. And the story is, is essentially evolution. So evolution has taken place over three billion years. We don't exactly know when life started, but the oldest cells are around three billion years old. And if you look at that spiral, um, on, the, on a 24 hour geological clock, human beings appeared in the last minute before midnight. So there's, there's this extraordinary amount of geological time um, that allows geological processes to take place. And that was one of the great scientific discoveries 
in parallel with, with Darwin um, and, and his ideas on evolution that really explained or allowed evolution to take place. Without geological time, um, the changes that Darwin envisaged just simply couldn't take place. Um, so just to summarize on that spiral, um, you know, the earliest human beings, Homo habilis, they evolved around two and a half, two point eight million years ago in the Pliocene. Sorry, sorry. Let's go back. Um, dinosaurs first appeared in the Triassic about 230 million years ago. We'll revisit them when we talk about the Trias in Warwickshire. And, and we know they were wiped out 65 million years ago, post Jurassic Park, um, when an asteroid collided with the Earth. Um, so that's another story for another day. Throughout geological time, there have been various mass extinction events, um, which have largely obliterated life. The, the extraordinary thing um, about geological time it, it, it is that it, um, it reveals huge crises, much more extreme than the current um, climate change and global warming, um, and, and life survives. In fact, the, the, the real story in there is actually that even though we are causing global climate change through adding CO2 to the atmosphere, and, and that is anthropogenic, it's, it's been caused by burning fossil fuels, um, actually the world, the Earth isn't threatened. Its impact on humanity might be large, um, but the Earth will survive, albeit on a time scale way beyond our species. So at the end, Permian mass extinction, some 250 million years ago, 96% of the planet's marine species all died. 70% of all land life all died. Um, and that pattern of extinctions, there are, there are these five mass extinction events, um, which cause dramatic change, but life survives and regenerates. Okay. So we're done geological time. Um, this is one of these Geological Society posters. There's an awful lot on there um, and you can stare at it while I'm talking. But I don't want you to take everything on that diagram. Um, the point of this, there are, there are two points. One is that there are three fundamental rock types. And I've brought them out on the right hand side of the slide. One's called igneous rocks. Another one is sedimentary rocks. And the third one is a metamorphic rocks. Igneous rocks are the molten ones that, that have um, experienced high temperatures and have melted. If they flow out onto the surface in a volcano, we call, we call them eruptive, um, such as lava flows or ash falls. We'll see some examples of those in Warwickshire. Um, if they're injected, um, like plutons, um, that we call them intrusive rocks, um, and they heat and modify the surrounding rocks. Sedimentary rocks are essentially the deposits of erosion, the products of erosion. A uh, good example would be sandstones um, or precipitation. So for example, if you have saline lakes um, which evaporate, they precipitate halite and gypsum. Halite, sodium chloride, gypsum, calcium sulfate. So there are two essential processes of deposition. Uh, one is erosion and one is precipitation. They take place in a wide spectrum of depositional environments, which the diagram kind of, kind of includes. And then there are metamorphic rocks, which can be either of those, sedimentary or igneous, but have been modified by both the combination of heat and pressure um, to change both their fabric, their texture and their mineralogy, as well as their structure. So metamorphic rocks, um, if you, for example, keep on burying a, um, a sequence of sedimentary rocks by adding more and more sediment onto the sea floor, you can produce huge, hugely thick packages of sediment. For example, um, offshore Pakistan on the Indus Delta, there's some 30,000 feet of sedimentary rocks. And by the time you get to the bottom of that pile of rocks, 
um, the temperatures are so high and the pressures are so high, those rocks, sedimentary rocks are starting to change and become metamorphic. Um, similarly, when um, continents collide, and the compressive pressures associated with the collision, continental collision form huge structures. Um, those pressures and the heat associated with compression change the rocks and they become metamorphic. So three types of rocks, um, and they all combine in that geological cycle. So the geological cycle, in a nutshell, it, it, it has um, the bottom left-hand half of the diagram has, has hard rocks that are um, essentially um, igneous and metamorphic rocks, igneous rocks intruding into a range of um, existing igneous rocks, and on the right-hand side, metamorphic rocks being deformed by recrystallization and heating and folding. And then above the land surface, you have all the sedimentary processes. So erosion, landsliding, travertines, um, and they form sediments that then become compacted, that mature. Um, so the whole notion of um, rock cycles is, is underpinned by plate tectonics and those three fundamental rock types. Gosh, that's, that's an awful lot, I know. So we've gone through some concepts and I hope it all made sense. By all means, ask if it, if it wasn't entirely clear. We're going to now jump on to the geology of Warwickshire. And this is a slide that I drew today. So this is hot off the press. I drew it because I couldn't find actually a, a coherent summary of the geology of Warwickshire that put it into a meaningful framework. Um, so on this slide, um, the first point is it's only that what we call the solid geology. So it only includes the rocks before the ice ages. So what we haven't included on this slide, we'll come to them at the end of the talk, uh, the quaternary rocks, the last two million years or so of ice age rocks. So it's everything under those. And you can see in Warwickshire, we have rocks that go right back to the Precambrian. They're not the oldest Precambrian rocks. The oldest ones in Warwickshire and just outside Warwickshire only go back to about one and a half billion years not the four and a half billion years that we know exist elsewhere. They're present in Canada and Australia, South Africa, and, and parts of India. So Warwickshire has some Precambrian rocks, and they're called the Charnian supergroup, and the one example we'll go and look at are the Caldicote Volcanics off the Nuneaton Nun Ridge. Um, and then you can see there are some, there are some gaps in the sequence. So um, on, the, on the slide, I've actually shown, for example, in the Silurian, uh, around 420 million years ago, uh, we know that elsewhere in the UK, actually in the, in the Midlands, there are these Silurian rocks, but they're actually not present at our crop in Warwickshire. So that surface above the Silurian in Warwickshire is a wiggly line. And geologists call that an unconformity. There's a time gap there. And that's because uh, there was some sort of plate tectonic event um, that deformed the rocks in the Silurian and older and caused uplift and erosion and whatever rocks were on top were, were removed. And then, the and then the Devonian was deposited on that unconformity. So there's another big unconformity at the end of the Carboniferous. There's a time gap there. So the coal measures in the Warwick group, which are late Carboniferous in age, are overlaid unconformably by Permian and Triassic rocks, and, even, and indeed younger rocks. And that unconformity there is, it, it has a name, it's called the Vriscan unconformity, and that was caused by a plate collision from the south um, that extends across the whole of Britain, and we'll explore that in a little while when we look at the geology of Warwickshire in some detail. So these big gaps, we call them unconformities. Now the ones of you that are really sharp and awake still, We'll notice that the top of the diagram stops at 145 million years. So you might say, well, what's happened since 145 million years? Well, that's another huge unconformity. And we'll explain what that is and how it took place later in the presentation. So Warwickshire has you know, the best part of a billion years of geological history. We've got these major gaps that we call unconformities that all tell part of this plate tectonic story. 
Um, the tertiary unconformity is, is huge in Warwickshire, but it's pretty much hidden. If, if I wasn't telling you about it, you probably wouldn't think it through. There are no rocks from the middle Jurassic to the Quaternary. They're all gone. They've all been eroded. Wow, where have they gone? Okay. I've also coloured, um, this is important too, I've, I've coloured the stratigraphy. Um, green for the really old rocks, blue to brown for the Carboniferous, and the blue Carboniferous are the limestones uh, and older marine sediments, and the Warwick group and coal measures are brown, and they're coal measures and barren red sandstones, and the Permian and Triassic are yellow and red, because they're deserts, and then the Jurassic is, is, is blue and yellowish because they're marine. So there's a, there's a theme to the colour coding, which will become apparent in the next two slides. Let's, let's move on there. Okay. So this is the same diagram, not quite as neat. I didn't have time to tidy it up, but it, it, it's the same diagram, except that on the right, I've added a box for environments. And this is the story that we started with the, the Brandon Wall that reflects Warwickshire's movement from south of the equator, across the equator, into the Northern Hemisphere. Anyone have a guess when Warwickshire, when Warwickshire went across the equator? Anyone think it was in the Trias when it goes yellow and red? Because that's when he did. So, pop it in the chat if you're not sure, if you don't want to unmute yourselves. <laughs> Anyone want to have a guess? Well, it was a tries. And the diagram on the left um, explains how climate um, and sedimentary rock types change with latitude. Uh, and it really is a function of temperature. Um, so the bottom of the diagram starts with the equator and it goes up to the poles. And then on the right hand side of that diagram is a frequency plot for the types of sediments you generate. So if you're at the equator, um, then you produce a mixture of um, coals and carbonates. Um, as you move further north, you get this huge increase of evaporites. Uh, and further north again into environments that produce coals because there's lots of vegetation. That's very annoying, sorry. Um, and then these things called tillites are, are glacial deposits uh, and you only get those at the, at the polar belts. So there is, as you move across um, latitude, there is this change in the main types of rocks that are precipitated or deposited um, that reflects the climate. Um, <clears throat> so the colour changes on this diagram really um, reflect the establishment of con continents, the amalgamation of early continents to form Pangaea, we'll come to Pangaea in a minute, and the northern movements of Pangaea by plate tectonics across the equator um, and then northwards as Pangaea disintegrated. And we'll come to the story of Pangaea in a moment. So the colour coding is important. Um, and on the right hand column, you can see that we start off with um, geol volcanoes um, and, and basement core. We then have a marine transgression and big marine embayments. Um, and elsewhere in the Salarian, not in Warwickshire, but elsewhere, and Worcestershire and Shropshire, uh, that all remains marine. And then there's a huge unconformity, um, defamation and exposure re resulting in Warwickshire, all of the Silurian being eroded away. After that into the Devonian, through into the Carboniferous Limestone, you see another marine transgression, a big flooding, um, more lavas and tufts. Uh, and then um, sedimentation takes place, which gradually um, fills those, those marine basins and they reach sea level. So you have large rivers, um, emerging coastlines, coal swamps and deltas, and emergent land with braided rivers. And at the end of the Warwick group is another huge unconformity we saw in the last slide. 
uh, and you then have another sequence of rocks which is essentially um, continental equatorial desert alluvial fans coastal plains evaporites large braided rivers and you go into the mercy munstone group and penarth group um, continental deserts and another marine incursion so there's a story in Warwickshire as the part of the continent, part of Britain that, that is now Warwickshire, moved across from the Southern Hemisphere, across the equator, into the Northern Hemisphere. Right, so this slide um, takes us back to the Precambrian. Um, and here it's called Protozoic, that's the latest part of the, of the Precambrian. Uh, and uh, the diagram on the left shows um, the orientation of the, the distribution of the continents. So wherever the slide shows ocean, that's oceanic crust. And wherever it shows continents, that's continental crust. And they've, they've all been given names by geologists. That's a failing that geologists have. They have to give everything a name. Um, and most of the names come from local local places so if you're not familiar with them it's all a bit obscure um, but back in the proterozoic if you look at the bottom one um, the late proterozoic 630 million years ago there's this large land mass um, that includes um, bits of what are present day south america bits of what are north america bits of siberia um, australia india in, in quite bizarre positions. So with time, they've moved. And the diagram on the left, on the right, um, then focuses on that bit of Laurentia um, and actually shows the position of the United Kingdom. And you'll note straight away, the United Kingdom is split into two parts. Um, on this little bit of, little bit of crust that's called Avalonia, is the is, is, is England um, and Wales and a little bit of, of Southern Ireland. If you then go across to this, this part of Laurentia here, um, there's Scotland and Northern Ireland and a little bit of Southern Ireland. And they're separated by an ocean. Do so you now know how that's possible? That's possible because of plate tectonics. So this, this line here, with the little diamonds on it, um, is a subduction zone. And this white line here is a spreading ridge. So this ocean was called Aipetus, and it was spreading across that uh, mid-oceanic mid ridge. So Baltica was moving away, and in this case, Laurentia was moving away from Gondwana. Um, and Avalonia was attached to Gondwana, but had a subduction zone in front of it. So essentially what happens, um, Scotland is moving away from England. Some might argue that's not entirely a bad thing. I don't agree. Um, but here at this, um, at this destructive margin, um, you bring in Baltica and Siberia closer to uh, Gondwana. And that's essentially what happens. <clears throat> the, the story of, of the late Precambrian into the Cambrian is the interplay between the spreading ridge and this subducting zone. So the story of, of Warwickshire in the Precambrian, we formed, we were part of um, a complex, an island, actually a landmass, uh, that's called Avalonia. Um, that was on the leading edge of this large continental plate, Gondwana. And the basement between, uh, beneath Warwickshire forms the core of Avalonia. And the story through time, there's two other snapshots, these plate reconstructions. So this one's um, for the Carboniferous, 310 million years ago. <clears throat> All those continents in the south have joined together. Oops. Um, that Iapetus Ocean is closed, so Scotland has joined back with. Sorry. 
Scotland has joined back with, with England and there's now a new ocean forming here that's called uh, Tethys, Paleotethys. If you go back to the Devonian 400 million years ago, um, sorry, Scotland and England were still joined up, but you have this huge reek ocean that separated Laurentia from Gondwana. And all this is taking place by plate tectonics, subduction versus um, spreading centers. So as you move forward, the story evolves. Um, so if you look top left, there's a reconstruction for the late Permian some 250 million years ago. Britain is located in the <clears throat> center of this, um, uh, it's very annoying. Britain's located in the center of this large continent here um, called Pangaea. There's a huge ocean, um, Paleotethys. As we go into uh, the Jurassic 150 million years ago, um, Tethys is still there. Uh, and now this Atlantic Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean is starting to form and Britain is still part of a major continent. Into the Cretaceous and 80 million years ago, um, the continents are starting to look like modern ones. So you can now recognize that discreetly Africa, South America, um, even though Laurasia is still Europe and North America joined together. Into the Eocene, the Atlantic Ocean is now splitting northwards uh, between Greenland uh, and North America uh, and extending with another rift north of the UK. The diagram on the right um, then, then tries to pull together how um, for not just for Warwickshire, but for, but for England or actually Britain, um, how Britain has um, changed latitude and host continent through time. Because I recognize all of those global reconstructions get a bit confusing. So if you go back to um, the early Paleozoic, the Cambrian, 550 million years ago, um, there are three timelines and they're the three uh, bits of continental crust, Laurentia, Avalonia, Remember, Warwickshire's on the Avalonia and Amorica. So they're all separate, but by the time you get to the Salarian, they've combined together um, to form, if you look on the right then, so Laurentia becomes Laurasia, becomes Pangaea by the Permian, becomes Laurasia in the Jurassic, and then Eurasia in the, in the Cenozoic. And the latitude goes from some 60 degrees south of the equator to 60 degrees north of the equator. And as we speculated in the stratigraphic column for Warwickshire, around the Permian Triassic, we passed across the equator. So no surprise, rocks in the Permian Triassic in Warwickshire are all desert sandstones and mudstones. So that tries to encapsulate the geological history of Warwickshire from a plate tectonic perspective. Yep. And again, I'll, I'll leave this presentation with Deborah so you can sit and go through it at your, at your leisure. So this is another diagram I drew today. We're now focusing away from plate tectonics onto the geology of the Midlands and Warwickshire in particular. The diagram on the right is the diagram you saw, bef you, you saw before which is the stratigraphic column with ages that I created and it's color coded, remember, for um, south of the equator in green, closer to the equator with the Carboniferous in blue and brown, the coal, and then into the Permian and Triassic on the equator and then north of the equator in the Jurassic. The map on the right, on the left, is, is a geological map of the English Midlands. And on that map, there's a bold black line in the middle uh, that encompasses Rugby, Stratford, Warwick, Nuneaton, Birmingham. That's the original outline of the county of Warwickshire. There is just behind that 
uh, a DOSH stat line, which shows the extent of uh, the West Midlands conurbation. And then there's a dashed line, uh, which corresponds to that purple blob on the um, inset location map of, the, uh, of England, showing the whole of the West Midlands. So this is the geology of the West Midlands in a few simple colours. And the colours on the map relate to the colours on the stratigraphy. So the oldest rocks are in green. And the first observation is there aren't very many old rocks on the map. So there are those dark green rocks immediately southwest of Nuneaton. Uh, there's another little collection of dark green rocks um, just south of Loughborough, which is called the Charnian Ridge. We'll, 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 we'll visit those shortly. And then there's a little green blob um, just to the uh, west of the Knoll Basin, south west of Birmingham um, and west of Warwick, and that's the Licky Hills. They're another location of uh, very old rocks. Then there's some pale green rocks off to the left-hand side, which are really out of our area of interest for the time being, but I've put them there so you just recognise that there are old rocks off to the west. That's actually important because that defines the edge of the basins which constitute most of the rocks in Warwickshire. So they're the old rocks, um, or the oldest rocks, Precambrian through to Silurian, and there are Silurian rocks in the Welsh Uplands, but not actually exposed in Warwickshire. So those dark green rocks in Warwickshire, and just across the border into Leicestershire in the Hinkley Basin, um, they're all Precambrian and Cambrian rocks. Really interesting, but a very, very small proportion of the whole rocks exposed in Warwickshire. And I'm kind of cheating because the, um, the Charnian Ridge isn't actually in Warwickshire. But they're, they're much the same rocks as on the Nuneaton Ridge. So they're really key, important localities for looking at the geology of very old rocks and, and whatever fossil life is preserved in them. And then um, there are the blue rocks and you see um, the blue rocks are associated with those brownish rocks and I've labelled two areas, one's called the Coventry Horst and another one's called the South Staffs, the South Staffordshire Horst and they're also quite old rocks, in fact you'll see that both the Nuneaton Ridge and the Licky Hills are associated with those two horsts and they're blocks of upstanding, uplifted rocks um, that are Devonian and Carboniferous in age, actually principally um, Carboniferous, um, that have been brought to the surface by faults. So the next thing to notice on that map, if we talk about the younger rocks, are the bright red lines. And the bright red lines are faults. And it's the faults that enable the older rocks to be juxtaposed against the younger rocks. We'll see this in a cross section in a minute. And on the faults, there's a red box which deline delineates the direction in which the rocks have been down thrown. So if, if, for example, we take the Coventry Horst, located between Nuneaton and, and, and Coventry and Warwick, um, that's got Carboniferous rocks, it's got the blue uh, millstone grit and um, the brown coal measures and Warwick group on top of it. And it's bounded to the west by a fault that then down throws into the Knoll Basin and it's bounded by a fault on its east that down throws into the Hinkley Basin. And much the same for the South Staffs Horst. It down throws um, towards the Cheshire and Stafford Basins and it down throws to the east into the Needwood and Knoll Basin. And then there's all these yellow and pink rocks, reddish pink rocks, that are the Permian and Triassic rocks, and they sit on top of those um, Coventry and Staffordshire horsts and whatever else is under underneath them. And they're actually occurring, if you look at the down throw ticks on the faults, those rocks are occurring within basins that are against the highs. And the main basins are, um, outside of our area of interest, there's the Cheshire Basin, which is a huge permatriasic basin. There's the Stafford Basin. Um, and then just north of us is the Needwood Basin, 
Um, and within our county, parts of the Hinkley Basin off to the northeast around the Neaton. Remember the opening slide, my title slide, was a picture from the Nuneaton Ridge looking out across the Hinkley Basin. And then south of Birmingham is this thing called the Knoll Basin. I actually live in the Knoll Basin for what it's worth. And another important structure on this map down to the southwest is the Worcester Graben, the Worcester Basin. And again, you look at the faults either side of the Worcester Graben, um, they down throw into the basin. And then on the right hand side of the map, um, there's a grey colour, then a sort of yellowy brown, and then a browny brown ochre colour. Um, they're Jurassic rocks, they're younger rocks that are sitting on top of um, the Triassic. And that map I've drawn from the, the British Geological Survey um, um, Geology Viewer app. So if you want to go and take a look at how these rocks are juxtaposed, um, that's a free app. You can download it for your, for your phone. You can have it on your desktop computer and you can explore completely free of charge all of these rocks with that app. Um, it's actually a great tool and completely free. So I recognize as a geologist, I know exactly what that map means, but if you're not familiar with maps, what we need to do is now look at a cross section because that helps us immensely in understanding how the spatial distribution of those rocks relates to the subsurface. So I've drawn a big black line across that map with a W and an E on it, and then line of section close to the E. That's a cross section I've now created through that map. There you go. So that's a vertical line through the rocks, west on the left, east on the right, showing how the rocks are um, expressed beneath the surface. You can see Birmingham's located, should we just go back one? Um, so this big fault here, um, the cross that crosses the line defines the Stafford Basin and then this Birmingham Basin sits on the other side of the Stafford Horse. So there's the Stafford Horse in the centre of the cross section, this is the Birmingham Basin, the Knoll Basin, the Stafford Basin sits over here on the west side, that's the South Staff's Horse or uplifted block. This is the Coventry Horse in the centre of the cross section. And you can see these green rocks just get to the surface on the line of the section. So these green rocks come up from below, go to the strut column on the top right. And actually, these are Precambrian and Cambrian rocks. They come all the way to the surface from deep down uh, and they're brought up by these faults that are upthrown. To the right of that, um, the rocks are downthrown. And this is the big sedimentary basin that includes the sediments of the Mercy Mudstone group, Sherwood Sandstone group, and the top part of the Carboniferous, the Warwick group. And here are the younger rocks, which overlap on top of these Triassic rocks, Lias and Jurassic. So the cross section um, brings out much more clearer what the geology is doing. The map shows the distribution of the rocks, and the cross section shows how they relate to each other in a vertical section. I hope that makes a bit more sense. So the red lines are the faults, they've come up from a long way down. Um, there's a, what we're calling a rift structure, the Knoll Basin, down faulted rocks. So you've got younger rocks now against older rocks. Same here, you've got younger rocks against older rocks, younger rocks against older rocks. And all of that's taken place because of plate tectonics. You now know about how plate tectonics work. So what you're looking here, looking at here, is a cross section through um, a combination of compressive structures bringing old rocks to the surface and extensional structures bringing younger rocks down against older rocks. Okay. So I'm really just capturing in one slide some really, really complicated geology um, that's been unraveled since the late 1980s, early 1990s. I did mention when we were talking about geology and society, seismic. 
Um, some of you know, some of you may know about seismic from oil and gas exploration, but seismic isn't just for oil and gas exploration. It, it, it just reveals lots of deep structure. It's really, really powerful for understanding structure. Um, so I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time explaining all of this, just to say that um, when you collect seismic um, over sedimentary basins, you record the deep structure, all the layers are reflections and refractions, um, and you get extraordinary detail of the subsurface structure. And the seismic doesn't tell you the age of the rocks, you get velocity from the rocks because they're measured in a thing called two-way travel time. That's the time it takes for the energy, the sound waves, to penetrate into the earth and come back. And seismologists, geophysicists, they measure those reflections and reconstruct them to produce these images. And then specialist geologists, stratigraphers and structural geologists then interpret those reflections. And wherever you have boreholes, if you drill a borehole on a seismic line, or a seismic line goes through a borehole location, in the borehole, um, geologists will record the rocks and date them. So the trick to interpreting seismic is calibrating the seismic to rock data in a borehole. And that's been done all over the UK. And this is an example that goes through east-west, it's actually west-northwest, east-southeast, um, across uh, Warwickshire, from somewhere near the Malvins, just into the margin of the Welsh borders, so to somewhere down near Stratford, showing how complicated the deep structure is, uh, how many faults there are, and how the rock layers vary in thickness. So there are some coloured horizons shown on the cross section. The deepest ones, uh, the deepest one in fact is the top basement, so is the Avalonia basement. Um, and then top of that, through to the blue, is the Carboniferous sequences. Um, and above that is, a, is, again, the upper Carboniferous stuff. And then above that, again, is the Perma-Triassic. So we have a huge understanding of the deep structure of Warwickshire, even though not all of those rocks are exposed at the surface, if that makes sense. And then the top right map is another complication. So this is actually um, taken from some regional gravity data. Um, in this case, measured from a satellite. Um, and the gravity data shows variation in um, depth to basement, de depth to structure. So the red colors are very shallow, the blues and the purples are very deep. So you can start to see um, underlying structure if you can make out the coastline of the UK, it's in black. Um, you can just about see Norfolk and Lincolnshire and then Yorkshire, um, Anglesey and North Wales, and South Wales, and then the Cornish granites, in fact. The Cornish granites are those blue blobs uh, on the bottom part of Southwest England. And I've actually overdrawn on that um, map the interpretation of this thing called the Midlands Microcraton that sits beneath Warwickshire. So that's this huge slab block of very old ancient rock and that's on the cross section at the bottom. So the very poor resolution image with a fuzzy um, seismic pattern is the Midlands Microcraton that underlies pretty much all of Warwickshire. And that's this old Craton Avalonian Precambrian age uh, that we see little bits of in, in, um, in Charnia, in the Licky Hills, and in Nuneaton. And that's why Nuneaton is such an important place geologically. So we're going to run through some interesting geological sites in Warwickshire. Um, the group maintains uh, over a hundred sites of local geological interest. You can see them on our website. All of them have um, a current report. Some of them have very recent ones because we update them all the time. There's the, there's the web link. Again, I'll send you the presentation so you can go and find them. Um, they're all over the county. Um, and, and if you want to look for fossils or just experience some of the local geology, these are good starting points. So the first one we're going to go to um, are the um, Precambrian volcanic rocks of the Nuneaton Ridge. 
So I've put together a composite of slides um, of this area. The top left is from a uh, Coventry Council guide called the Quarrymen's Trail. So if you Google that, um, you find a copy of this trail guide. So there are footpaths that walk around it. I haven't actually been on this. Have you been on it, John? I've been on some parts of it, but yeah. not the whole trail. My understanding is that not all of the quarries are as accessible as one might like, but, but you can still walk that trail. It, 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 it is, does still have public access. Um, so the, the quarries actually line up along the outcrop of the important rocks because that's what they were quarrying. Um, and the quarries are listed one, two, three, four, not one of them, five of them, no, four of them. Um, and the picture on the right is, is, is from Boone's Quarry. And that's a, a picture of the Caldicote Volcanics. And they may look quite difficult rocks, well, in fact, in some ways they are. Um, but these are volcanic rocks, um, and they're a particular type of volcanic rock. So the graph on the right is a measured section through all of the rocks in that quarry. Um, at the bottom is a sequence of sediments, um, fairly fine grained sediments, and then on top of it is that rock with the dots on it, and that's what we're calling a tuff. And a tuff um, is a type of extrusive igneous rock um, that gets erupted out of a volcano as an ash cloud. And in this case, it was a very explosive type of volcanic eruption, and it was actually ejecting crystals out of the magma chamber. So the, some of the nicest rocks from um, Boone's Quarry, are the, we call them crystal tufts, and you can actually see there are crystals um, preserved in the, in the rock, uh, crystals of particular minerals, augite, um, feldspar, and others, and they're quite coarse grained. And then the next picture to the right of that is a graded tuff. So these are much, much finer ash materials. And as um, eruption takes place, um, you initially get a very, very abrupt flow of material coming out of, out of the ash cloud. And then the velocity falls off and the material gets finer grained. So you get this process called grading. And you can see that grading in the colors. So if you get close up to the rocks in Boone's Quarry, you can see these grading graded beds um, of volcanic tufts. So these are very, very old, Precambrian, um, 550 million years old, a bit older. And they are the basement rocks of Avalonia. That's this big slab of continental crust underlying the whole of Warwickshire that I just brought to the surface on the Dunedin Ridge. And that little cartoon, or little picture, sorry, um, bottom right, is someone's view, um, a geologist that's worked these rocks, um, how he thinks it, it would have looked in Caldicote times in Warwickshire. Lots of volcanic cones, um, Precambrian, so no land animals, um, lots of nasty smelling sulfurous gases, um, a very inhospitable landscape. The next locality I want to take you to is just outside of Warwickshire. You remember we, on the map, um, of the Midlands, I pointed out the Charnian Hills just into Warwickshire. So there's a very spectacular exposure at a place called Barden Hill, and a footpath actually goes around the top of the quarry so you can peer, peer down into it. And that shows um, two rock types, and I put a dashed white line separating them. So above the dashed white line um, are Triassic rocks, that are approximately 220 million years old. And if you look closely, if you, if you ignore um, the ledges that the quarry workers cut and look at the red rocks, you can see that they are concave downwards. Um, so that bedding is um, concave into that large unconformity structure. So they're Triassic sitting above Precambrian rocks. So Precambrian rocks, about 550 million years old, with Triassic rocks on top, 250 million years, there's a large unconformity, a huge time gap. 
at that service. Um, and the unconformity is a paleo valley. So it's a valley on the Precambrian surface into which Triassic sediments were deposited. And that type of bedding um, represents the sediments washing into the huge channel, the huge valley in the in the Precambrian surface. So you can go and examine that. If you go a little bit further to the north, away from Barden Hill to Bradgate Park into Leicestershire, um, Bradgate Park exposes the same rocks, and that's the place where um, a schoolboy, Roger Mason, in 1957, um, just after I was born, um, he was 16, he was rummaging around in Bradgate Park, and he found these impressions that he, that he thought were a leaf. So a long story ensued, um, the rocks were eventually dated, and those fossils are now known to be, it's not a plant at all, um, it's um, a very precursor sponge that lived on the sea floor, and these at the time were the oldest fossils known in Britain. So there you go, there's a story of um, a schoolboy um, explorer, he's now quite a famous geologist, Roger Mason, but when he was 16, just walking around uh, Bragate Park, found these fantastic fossils which are called after him. They're now called Charmy and Masoni. Um, so he, as a schoolboy, he's got a fossil named after him and there are papers that describe these rocks and for these fossils in great detail. And they, they were the oldest rocks in Britain at the time. Wow. And that's, uh, you know, both those localities are, are very accessible, not too far drive from, from Warwickshire. So back into Warwickshire. So we've looked at Precambrian. We're now going to look at a Cambrian to Ordovician sequence. And this is in the Hartsill sandstone in another one of these quarries on the Quarryman's Walk. It's G's Quarry. Um, this is still accessible, I'm told, although I haven't been there. And this is famous for um, the sandstones contain um, lots of worm burrows, vertical worm burrows, which are very well known and in the overlying pearly shales they're a little bit younger so the Cambrian Hearts Hill sandstone is 500 to 550 million years old sitting on the Precambrian rocks and you can see they're tilted and folded so they've been through plate tectonic erogenies um, but the pearly shales on top are famous for this this trilobite it's um, a species of calavia um, and some superb specimens have been found the trilobites, they were marine arthropods that lived on the seafloor, um, a little bit like, um, what's the word, it's the um, lice, the um, wood lice that we find today in, in, in moist, wet environments uh, on land. They're called trilobites because they had a head, a central body portion, and a tail, trilobe, trilobites. Um, and they live from the Precambrian through into the um, Silurian, so a long-lived long species. So there's several localities if you want to look at very old rocks. Old rocks are difficult to interpret and understand, um, but certainly they're quite special, so, so well worth a visit. And I'm going to jump. Um, we're going to miss out Silurian and Devonian are going to jump to the Carboniferous. And in Warwickshire, the Carboniferous, Carboniferous has been a really important economic resource. Um, the coals were mined for firing to generate uh, electricity and coal gas. Um, sandstones have been widely used for building stones and aggregates, and the mudstones uh, were and still are uh, used as a source, as a clay source for, for brick manufacture. Um, there are two big quarries, one run by Weinerberger, um, that still take out um, clays to, to make some very special, they're called blue bricks, which are um, um, high temperature bricks, and, and the one quarry in Warwickshire is, is unique. Um, so carboniferous rocks, as you, if you go back to the, think back to the cross section, that they actually underlie much of Warwickshire, but they're not exposed at the surface very much. Yeah, because they're covered in, in all the younger rocks. They only occur in these two upstanding horsts, um, the, the Coventry horst and the South Staffs horst. But if you look at the map on the right, uh, you can see those two horsts, the Warwickshire coalfield, 
um, and to its to its west there's the grey and green bit of the South Staffordshire coalfield. Um, but if you look at the Warwickshire coalfield, the extent of the coal extends a long, long way south. Um, you would hardly believe that underneath Oxford is a coalfield. Not that it's ever been mined, it's quite deep. So this Warwickshire coalfield extends north-south in a large embayment under the younger rocks. It's completely concealed, you can't, you can't see them, but they have been penetrated in boreholes. Before coal became very unfashionable, there were quite ambitious plans to exploit that hidden coal beneath Oxfordshire. Okay, um, so the rocks we see at outcrop are only the uppermost part of um, the Carboniferous. So that's the Warwick group and the coal measures sensu stricto. And these are river and, and delta top and lake sediments. And the map in the middle is a paleogeography for this part of the Carboniferous. We call it the Westphalian. It's not particularly relevant. Um, so that map shows in, in grey the areas that were upstanding land and in, in plain white the areas where sediment was being deposited. So at the time there was a Wales Southern Ireland high land and an area that goes from London across to Belgium in Brabant, another highland, and the areas in between were where sediments were being deposited. The upper sediments, the Warwick group, are often called the barren measures um, because they represent drier conditions than the true swamps of the coal measures. Um, so there are wet soils, but, but no swamps, so no coals form. And we're going to go and look at a quarry um, just north of the M42, not far from where I live, just west of, uh, just east of Solihull. It's, um, it's called Kingsbury Quarry. It's the quarry owned by Weiner Berger. It's still active. Um, and it's a really interesting quarry and you can get access if you're interested. So on the left is a diagram that shows the stratigraphy. Um, so the colours, um, uh, the, the pale greens and, and blues are the very oldest parts of the Carboniferous, which we don't see in Warwickshire. And the column for Warwickshire is this one here. It's the second from the left. That's the Warwickshire sequence. It sits above what we know in Derbyshire, includes the marine sequences. So in Warwickshire, you've got the grey coloured um, coal measures and the, the Warwick group in red. So that's the, that's the stratigraphy. Uh, and then the diagram to the right of that is a map I've taken from the British Geological Survey Geology View, the one you can go and look at, and I've annotated it with the formation names. So things to note, if you remember back to the map of the West Midlands and the map of the geology of Warwickshire, I'd shown these faults in red. So this bit to the right of, the, of that big fault is, is the Coventry Horst. These are the old rocks. The Merry Vale is, is Pre-Cambrian or Cambrian. These are then Carboniferous coal measures on top. The Truro Formation, Hailzone Formation, all Carboniferous. So this is the, sorry, Sorry. This is the big fault that marks the edge of the Coventry horse, down throwing into the Knoll or Birmingham Basin to the, to the west, which is actually called the Western Boundary Fault. Older rocks exposed, brought to the surface, and right across the southern part of Kingsbury Quarry um, is a, another fault, but the arrows, it doesn't have a down throw and tick, the arrows go from side to side. So this is what we call a strike slip fault. And that runs across the quarry. This is one of those transform faults that accommodated um, tectonic movements in a compressional regime. So if you jump to the next image on the right, that's actually in Kingsbury Quarry. And a colleague of mine, Bernard Besley, also from Keel, who's an expert on carboniferous rocks, is just pointing out that's the southern end of the quarry. And the yellowish, creamish colour is the big fault going across the southern side of the quarry. If you can focus and get your eyes in, uh, you can just about make out that the beds above the fault to the left here are sort of horizontal. If you follow around this side, the beds are vertical. They bend and they become vertical. So this is deformation from that strike slip fault running across the quarry. 
and these red colours are typical of the barren red measures. So this is the so-called Etruria formation. Um, in the barren red measures, and when you get close up to it, it's actually a horrible rock, <clears throat> but it's got this um, reddish, purplish, greyish mottled texture. And they represent um, colour mottling in a carboniferous soil. So these, these were wet, um, waterlogged soils um, with vegetation, but not enough vegetation to form swamps and therefore no coals. But they do contain lots of fossil leaves. So if you get into um, Kingsbury Quarry and look in the thin sandstones and the, uh, and the muds, you can find lots of delightful carboniferous fossil leaves. Yeah. Okay, so Kingsbury Quarry, great example of, of carboniferous sediments associated with the coal measures. We're now going to jump onto the Trias. We're going to spend a look at three localities in the Trias. And just to give you a bit of context, because all of this stuff, I'm afraid, I'm sorry, it needs context. So the Trias overlays the Permian, and my wiggly lines on this diagram are unconformities. So the Permian ends at around 250 million years and the Trice goes through to around 200 million years ago before it's overlain by the big marine transgression of the Jurassic. A transgression is when sea levels rise. We'll look at what reasons there might be for that in a little while. Sea levels rise and they flood the continent. So the Jurassic is this marine sequence that sits on top of completely continental sediments. And the colour coding on them is shown in the key on the bottom right hand corner. Yellow is alluvial and fluvial sandstones and aeolian windblown dunes. Um, the brownish mauvish colours are mudstones. Um, the bright red, the strong red colours are salt, halites, sodium chloride. And then I've also highlighted this thing called the Arden sandstone, which is a late margin sequence, as is the top top of this siltstone. So Triassic rocks overlay Permian rocks um, and they're all continental, um, essentially desert sandstones and mudstones with, it, with their own story to tell before the tr Jurassic marine transgression, marine flood comes in. So the Triassic in Warwickshire, you've, you, you've, you've now heard me talk about this thing called the Worcester Graben, the structure called the Worcester Graben, which is a downfaulted basement, uh, a basin. Um, the diagram on the left here is a perspective view of England and Wales that's colour coded for um, depth in sedimentary basins. And the faults in this case are shown in black as, as strong lines, not as red that I prefer. Um, so you can see that, and, and the blue is, is, is a long way down, it's deep to in, in the sedimentary basin, and browns and yellows are shallower. So the, the Worcester Graben is this deep rift basin that goes up into the Cheshire Basin to the northwest, and via this complex into the Needwood Basin and the Knoll Basin and the Hinkley Basin under Warwickshire. So in Warwickshire, we have this um, deep rift system that's filled with Triassic sediments. I did mention at some point the notion of this continent Pangaea. Pangaea is this large supercontinent that incorporates um, North America, um, Europe and parts of Asia and US, uh, the Soviet Union and China. Down here it's also Africa and India and Australia. So it's a huge continent all amalgamated together. And the UK sits in the middle of it just north of the equator where the, where the star is. Big ocean off to the south and, and um, east. Uh, and Britain sat in, this, in the middle of this continent in the Triassic, Perma-Triassic, um, just north of the equator. So it was incredibly hot. In fact, there have been some academic studies of minerals that contain fluids. And those fluids can be used to reconstruct both the salinity and the temperature of, of, the, of the climate. And those studies suggest that at times the surface temperatures reach 60 degrees centigrade. That's 10 degrees hotter than it ever does today. In, the, in, in our hottest deserts in um, places like um, Sindh in, in southern Pakistan and the Thar Desert in India and parts of Saudi Arabia, we get temperatures 50, 51, 52 
But here in Pangaea, in the Trias, temperatures on the Earth's surface reach 60 degrees. That's a bit hot. Right. So um, Solihull Council, Metropolitan Council, bless them, were looking at using um, these Triassic sandstones as a uh, geothermal um, heat source. And they drilled um, in Tudor Grange Park, um, a 300 meter borehole to try and tap into that um, geothermal resource. And, and Ray Pratt and I have looked at this core. So there's a wonderful um, sequence of 300 meters of these Triassic Mercy Mudstone group um, sediments. They're actually called the Sidmouth Mudstone Formation. And on the left, you can see some of that core. We've actually cleaned it off and had a good look at it. Um, and it contains lots of interesting textures. The two that I have brought some to detail, um, one's got a big gypsum nodule. Gypsum is calcium sulfate that forms uh, in the sediment due, due to evaporation. And the bottom rock is um, some laminated sediments over um, a, a soil in the Mercy Munster group. So that's showing a, a small flooding event. So very quickly, the story here, um, we produce a sedimentary log through those rocks, which I've colored there for you in, in, in yellow for sandstones, green for the mottling and red for the color uh, for the mudstones. And we measured the magnetic susceptibility in those rocks. Um, and we've got a record through, in this case, I'm showing you some 20 meters of it. Um, and then we've done some um, modeling on the cyclicity in those uh, susceptible in those magnetic responses. And to cut a long story short, um, the cyclicity um, has a periodicity of around 400,000 years. And lo and behold, that actually corresponds to the excitentry, ex excitentry associated with um, the orbit of, of, of Venus around um, the Sun and, and Earth. So we think we have in these red sediments because they're very difficult to date, there are no fossils in them. Um, we think we have a record of, of a 400,000 year cyclicity that's rep that, that represents um, variation in the Earth's or orbicity. Extraordinary. So Mercy Mudstone Group, continental mudstones um, from the um, late Triassic. And in the middle of that sequence is a really fascinating sandstone unit it's actually called the Arden Sandstone and it is local to Warwickshire. So there are many localities you can you can visit this this, this outcrop. And there's a picture of Ray Pratt um, who, who worked um, with the Warwickshire Geological Conservation Group to clear this outcrop. This is on the um, A4189 as you leave Henley and Arden going up towards Clavendon um, and you can see the sequence of rocks 200 meters and a, a lateral extent and five, six vertical meters, a bit more actually, eight vertical meters through this Arden sandstone. It's got nice conglomerates, lots of cross beds, lots of river class and, and, and um, desiccation cracks. And when you look at it in detail, um, it's, it's full of fossils. These are not all from that one outcrop. And some of these were collected many years ago by um, a famous um, geologist, Reverend Peter Brody who died in 1897 or thereabouts. But he spent a lot of time working on the Arden sandstone and collected all these fossils. Well, he collect all these, but he collected many fossils. So the top left A is a shark dorsal fin spine. It's about 15 centimeters long. So that tells you this shark was about two meters long. Um, sample B is um, a portion of a fish that came out of the Arden sandstone. Um, it's actually called Semiontus. So we know that this was um, freshwater fish, not marine. These are freshwater sharks. Um, C are things called Eustheria. So they're little crustaceans. Um, the common name is the clam shrimp. So the little crustacean that lives in a shell, shell looks like a clam shell. Um, the crustacean looks like a shrimp, so it's a clam shrimp. And they live in ephemeral pools that, um, and they can survive being dried out. Um, there's some plant remains, stigs, um, twigs of uh, stigmaria, and then E and F are actually fossil lizards, uh, things called rhynchosaurids. 
uh, small lizards, not very big. You can see that's one centimeter. So it's, it's, you know, his feet were you know, a centimeter or so in, 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 in breadth in, in this example. And the one, the bigger one, F, um, Reverend Brody thought this was uh, an example of a rhynchosaurid sitting down. So the middle depression is where it plumped its, plumped its bum and its two feet then uh, sat out in front of it. So supposedly a bottom imprint of a, of a fossil lizard. So the Arlen sandstone is, is, is actually really quite remarkable. It's this one sandstone unit that sits in the middle of all these red mudstones um, and that's full of fossils. The mudstones have, have no fossils and yet this, this Arlen sandstone is, is full of fossils. So we think this was a lake. And the diagram on the right um, shows you a paleographic reconstruction for the late Triassic. Um, you can make out the South Staffs Coalfield and the Coventry Horst. And then the sort of pale blue colour is the Arden Sandstone Lake that extends all the way from near Worcester, um, across the Worcester Graben, north of Malvern, up towards Birmingham, and out onto the flanks of the Warwickshire Horst. Um, it's this huge lake in which sharks lived, fish lived, clam shrimps were thriving, and around the margins of the lake, fossil lizards um, were tramping around in the, in the fine sediment. So what's also incredible about this Arden sandstone um, is that this represents the dawn of the dinosaurs. This is, this is not even Jurassic Park, this is Triassic Park. Uh, this, uh, this wet event um, towards the late Triassic, monsoonal rains actually marked the start of a huge climatic change. And that's nicely shown in this diagram that I've taken from one of Mike Benton's. Mike Benton's the very famous um, dinosaur geologist that's written many books and many papers. And this, this one comes out of current biology. I think it's, um, it's a free download. It's an open source publication. But here is explaining that in this, in the Triassic, and the Arden sandstone is actually of Carnian age, so you can see the change from um, dark purple into light purple. Um, we've got these um, early, what are called cruorostarsins in the early Triassic, which are not really dinosaurs. Um, but dinosaur morphs, but they're not true dinosaurs, they're essentially lizards. Um, and beyond after that, after the Carnian pluvial event, after the, after the Arden sandstone, you see this sudden explosion of dinosaurs. So we go from sort of cro crocodile type animals into true dinosaurs very quickly over, over a space of a few million years. So this is a huge um, evolutionary expansion at the time of the Arden sandstone. And you can go and stand and look at the Arden sandstone here in Warwickshire, Henley and Arden, on the, on the Grand Union Canal at Shrewley and Rowington, just across the border into Worcestershire at Inkbarrow, you can actually go and sample and explore for dinosaur remains, sharp remains in the Arden Sandstone. Great locality. So that's done the Triassic. That leads us on to the last few um, rock uh, periods uh, and, and, and Jurassic of course, um, is, is famous for dinosaurs. So we have our own Jurassic Park here in Warwickshire. And this example is um, the Southern Cement Works, um, South Warwickshire, near, near, near Richington, uh, where the lias, the Lower Jurassic, are exposed. And these are marine limestones and shales, also used for, for building stones and they contain an extraordinary um, fossil assemblage that includes these incredible ichthyosaurs. This particular one came from the Harbury Quarry, and there's a photograph taken in 1928, not by me, I hasten to add. Um, and this ichthyosaur is, you can now still see it in the Natural History Museum in London. And if you can get into um, southern cement works, there are many, many fossils, belemnites, ammonites, um, bivials, gryphia, if you come on one of our trips, it's well worth a visit if you're a fossil hunter. Above the lias um, are some slightly younger rocks, um, the most famous of which is um, a rock called the Horton Stone, which is also known as the Marlstone. 
It's also known as the Banbury Ironstone. And this is um, um, a former important um, rock because it contains 25% iron and was used um, in steelworks for South Wales. <clears throat> So this is um, our Jurassic Park. It's at um, exposed at, at, at Burton Dasset and on Edge Hill. Uh, and the actual rock um, is this rather nice um, orangey brown. Um, it's actually um, a particular type of texture. We call it ooids. We'll come onto that in a second. <clears throat> and it contains um, lots of lots of bivalves and brachiopods. And there's an example of that shown here. <clears throat> Bottom centre is it's a typical church built from Horton stone with this gorgeous um, orangey brown colour. So um, Burton Dasset is, is one of our um, LGS sites. You can go and walk around the old workings, have a picnic there on a nice summer's day, glorious place to take in a gentle stroll with the kids and explore some geology and archaeological history. The reason why the um, <coughs> Horton sandstone contains iron it's quite a complicated story, but it has two important minerals in it. One's called siderite, which is iron carbonate, and another one is called beatherine, which is um, an iron magnesium aluminosilicate. It's actually a clay mineral, but it has a sort of green colour when it's fresh, and when it oxidises, it goes to that nice brown colour, if it has the siderite. So if you find it fresh, which you won't, um, but if you were to find it in a borehole or a new working, it's actually a greeny brown colour when it's been exposed to the air it goes to that orangey brown colour. So how did the Horton sandstone form? <clears throat> well um, the Jurassic as, as we've seen um, is this marine flooding so what was land in the Carboniferous and through the Permian and Trias has now become a marine embayment so every, everywhere on the map that's blue is marine. And Warwickshire, of course, sits right pretty much in the south centre of the map, just north of the Worcester Basin. Sorry. <laughs> um, Warwickshire sits here in the blue, so it's this shallow marine embayment. The water was never very deep here. It would be a few tens of metres. And a good modern analogue would be somewhere like um, the... Bahamas, where you have these um, shoal sandbanks that are made of ooliths. And an oolith um, is a precipitate of calcium carbonate. It's actually a mineral called aragonite, which is a polymorph of calcite um, that forms in carbonate saturated seawater and it precipitates around um, a quartz grain or a, 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 um, any type of um, detrital material on the seafloor. And because it gets rolled in um, shallow currents, they form circular grains, ooliths. So they're formed in high energy shoals in a humid climate in a shallow sea. Actually a great place to go for a holiday. Um, so I think that's probably finished the Jurassic. Yeah, I think so. So yeah, Burton Dasset, you can go and imagine that you're wading through shoal sandbanks in the Bahamas. Great place. Let's move on to the last section. So we've only got five minutes to go or thereabouts before we wind down to a discussion. Um, so you, you remember I did talk about when we had the strat column up um, that there was no rocks younger than um, Jurassic in Warwickshire until you get to the Quaternary. So that, has, brings the question, where, where did all those young rocks go? Were they ever deposited or have they been eroded by uplift and are no longer there? So the answer is, is the latter. Yeah, they were deposited, but since the um, end Cretaceous and tertiary, Great Britain as a whole has undergone periods of uplift. We call it um, exhumation or inversion. And they're caused by, by two prime um, tectonic processes, again, both driven by plate tectonics. The first one is what's labelled in green there, the Atlantic margin. So um, the Atlantic Ocean um, started to widen, split, and that splitting process caused uplift all along the western margin of Britain. 
so much so that in the in the Paleocene, um, we have on the west coast of Scotland, Sky, Mol, Ardnamurchan, intrusive complexes um, that are formed by um, the rifting taking place on, on the west of Britain. And with that rifting, there was uplift. Um, so all the rocks that were from Jurassic to um, Quaternary, actually you know, to Tertiary in, um, in the central England have been eroded because of that uplift. There's another process from the south, um, the collision of Africa with Europe created the Alps. And in Britain, the far field effects of the Alps, or the Alpine collision, has been uplift and folding. If you want to see the first first hand expression of that, um, the folding in the Isle of Wight and on the Dorset coast, Stair Hole, is a direct consequence of that Alpine tectonics, the compression from Africa colliding with Europe. So two things took place here, rifting of the Atlantic Ocean to form an Atlantic margin with volcanic intrusions along the Hebridean coast and Alpine tectonics, so all of that uplifted central Britain. So those rocks, the late Jurassic, the Cretaceous, were deposited but have now been eroded. So in Britain there were very few tertiary rocks deposited because Britain was a high, except for on the southeast coast, Norfolk down into Essex and, and Wessex where um, tertiary rocks were deposited. So that's a huge unconformity in Warwickshire at the top of the lower Jurassic all the way through to the Quaternary. And then on top of that, on top of sitting on top of the Jurassic rocks, now are these Quaternary um, rocks that are two million years old or thereabouts and they're essentially river gravels. So the story here is, is that in the Ice Age, um, as the Earth cooled, as it did repeatedly from about um, yeah, two million years ago to, to, to 10,000 years ago, ice repeatedly advanced and one of the advances came all the way down to Warwickshire. The map on the right shows that. Um, so the um, solid black line is the limit of the Anglican ice that, that came down into Warwickshire. And there's a little area extending north of Warwickshire into Derbyshire and beyond, which is this um, progression of Lake Harrison. <clears throat> and then south of that, huge rivers draining from the, uh, the melty ice sheets um, flowed across to the east. In fact, um, they flowed in the opposite direction to the current day rivers. So the diagram bottom left is a sketch I've made that shows the Avon, the current Avon Valley going from Stratford Avon and Snitterfield, Waverley Wood, all the way up to Leicester and turning right through Bitham out towards the North Sea at Great Yarmouth, the Proto-Avon River didn't flow down to the Severn and out into the Bristol Channel, it flowed in the other direction, it flowed to the east. So these rivers at the end uh, of, the, of the Ice Age deposited huge gravels that flowed um, off the and beneath the ice sheets covering central and, and northern England out to the to the North Sea and then another huge river the Ancaster River that flowed in Lincolnshire along the north 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 Norfolk coast and if anyone's been to Happysburg you can actually walk out on the um, glacial surface that's exposed at low tide and you can see human footprints it's a stunning locality that's been beautifully preserved by the Norfolk Geological Society and so that's worth a, worth a visit to if you if you adventure outside of Warwickshire. So in Warwickshire we have in the Avon Valley uh, a record of these gravels um, in, in several pits. I'm, I haven't been there so I'm not sure what state those pits are in. Uh, I know some have been backfilled but I think some are open. So these um, gravels, pebbly deposits, they're as old as two million years old um, and um, they contain a suite of, of um, mammoth fossils, mammoth bones, mammoth teeth, um, bits of tusk um, that um, 
uh, there have been many finds because the pits are huge. There have been massive workings. You can see on the map, um, top right center, some of the pits, the gravel pits working in the Avon Valley. So there we go. These are anything from 400,000 years old to 2 million years old. So we've now covered a billion years of geological history in Warwickshire. And I think at that point, I've probably said enough. Um, what time is it? Yes, so it's gone eight o'clock. It's, it's time for me to stop, I think. I'm most welcome to take any questions, open a discussion on how this relates to any of your um, wildlife trust conservation work, biodiversity interests, because of course the geology underpins um, all of the landscape and natural environment. Okay, thank you very much for staying with me. Oh, thank you so much, Stuart. That was really interesting. Um, it's really nice to have a, a talk that focuses on local stuff that people can go and see in particular. Because um, often we, we cover broader concepts, obviously about yeah. conservation, but it's really nice to have that, that real local focus. Um, your, your, oh. your, best, your best resource for the for local sites is the Warwickshire Geological Conservation Group website. Yeah. And a list of SSIs and um, LGS sites. Yes, yeah, definitely. And um, we can check that out. Um, I was going to ask really what your, what, what, which site in Warwickshire do you think is most interesting geologically <laughs> to go and see, to actually see what's going on? It depends what you want to do. I mean, th th there are many. Um, so that, that, that's almost a, um, a question that requires another question uh, <laughs> in response. So, I mean, there's such a variety of rocks. Um, the outcrops are few and far between, but as you've seen, you go from Precambrian volcanics to sandy and muddy deserts to glacial gravels. So it depends what, what you want to see. Um, of course, the rocks have an impact on what plants grow. Um, large amounts of Warwickshire are covered in Triassic Mercy Mudstone Group and the Mercy Mudstone Group is a clay so it, it's it's not a it's not a permeable formation so it, it generates fairly waterlogged soils quite heavy clay soils um, and the mineralogy of the Mercy Mudstone Group is very rich in iron and magnesium so it produces a particular type of soil. Um, if your interest is in fossils um, I mean, there aren't many hugely fossiliferous sites in Warwickshire. It, re it requires a lot of effort and patience to find fossils. So it depends what you want to see, Deborah. Sure, okay. Um, our uh, Dunsmore Living Landscape Project um, yep. uh, installed a mammoth kind of statue thing in Wrighton Pools yep. um, as a, a kind of marker for what's been found there. Um, and you can find out a bit more if you want about the Dunsmore Living Landscape Project, um, people on this webinar, um, and how that links to, to a few of the uh, geology links as well from the Trust. Um, does anyone have any questions? You can turn your videos on or unmute yourselves or put it in the chat. Yeah, please, please do. Yeah, yeah. Or, or comments or anything. Uh, can I just bring in a slightly different aspect? Um, when I, I used to work in Derbyshire, where the geology was right in your face, you yeah. couldn't escape it. And when I came across here to Warwickshire, I thought I'd made a big mistake because I couldn't find any geology at all at first. <laughs> um, but you had to look harder. And it became apparent that Warwickshire is remarkable as a county in that I don't think there's another county anywhere in the country that has got such a complete geological column within the county boundary, because as Stuart has been pointing out, you can go from the, even with just, with solid rocks, if you like, from the Precambrian right up to the Middle Jurassic. And he skipped over one or two points, but there are actually almost a continuous, every, count, every geological period is represented within Warwickshire. You've got to stretch a point for the Silurian. Yeah. But if you look at the, um, derived pebbles 
that are in the um, the Carboniferous gravels, you will actually find salarine limestones with actually salarine fossils in fossils. them. Yeah, yeah. So it's cheating a bit, um, but there is an outcrop of Devonian, and um, I think the other thing to think about is it because getting access to quarries now is really very very difficult. Um, even our group is having problems. And the only one that's really open on a regular basis is Crosshads Quarry, which is right down on the southern tip of Warwickshire and is um, an exposure of the, the oolitic limestones of the Jurassic that Stuart was talking about. And there are fossils to be found there. Um, but beyond that, it's now incredibly difficult to get into uh, sites. Um, However, you can make some interesting geological observations simply by looking at old buildings as you drive past them. Um, some things you take for granted and perhaps don't think about it. But if you look at Warwick Castle, for example, yeah. and then you look at Kenilworth Castle, you might have just looked at them as two castles, but have you thought that one of them is actually buff colored and the other one's bright red? And that is because you've crossed the geological boundary between those two towns. The um, Kenilworth is older and it's Permian, and the um, the sandstone at the Gorick Castle is Triassic. I see, yeah. And you I can think... do that all over the county. So as you go down, cross onto the edge of the Jurassic, you go up through the villages of Ufton and Harbury and round there. They're made of a white of white limestone. Um, which marks the very, very top of the Triassic. And then as you go further across to the east, then you're heading into the Jurassic and you're getting new Elias buildings. And ultimately you're getting into the um, milestone rock that uh, Ben Stewart had a photograph of a church there. You'll have those at Kyneton, the St. Peter's church there has actually got a mixture of both Elias and the milestone together. And you can start to get approximate geological boundaries without actually seeing true exposures as long as you're looking at old buildings because it was so difficult to transport stone and expensive it was and expensive so it was very much local and it, all the national trust properties were probably bulk of it was probably dug out of the ground within their park yeah so it, there is a lot of um extrapolation from what you can actually see from the buildings to what may well be under your ground under the ground at that point. I think the other point that Stuart was touching on about habitats is important as well. I don't think bare rock is actually considered as a habitat, but it should be. It should be, yeah. Yeah. Um, you've got lots of spiders and invertebrates and so on that depend on that. And as quarries are prime targets for landfill, then all of those natural exposures are very much under threat. And I think it's something that the, the Wildlife Trust should be actually thinking about in terms of the small creepy crawlies that don't get the publicity of the big fluffy animals. And that's, and that's why places like Mouse Hill Dingle, which are quite unique microenvironments, are actually quite special and, and probably do merit some attention. Mm. It's, a, it's a haven for mosses, lichens, um, ferns. Yeah, two, um, two yeah. We've been doing some work in the project um, on on some of the less popular or lesser known species and and groups like spiders and um, yep. you know uh, things like well bryophytes and other other things that people don't necessarily think of and study so much um, because it's really? so important for people to. To get into it um because yep. they're just so under recognized under reported and unknown and and we're losing things like that so yeah that's a really interesting point about the the bare rock habitat as it were and the the habitat they provide for different flora and fauna 